Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to welcome you all. Um, as Chris said, this is our regular monthly Friendship Force Sacramento meeting. Um, and so we always try to do something of interest. And this one is particularly interesting to me. Just we went to Germany on a journey back in 2018. And this is a more recent trip. And we got a, a, a talk on Northern Germany Friendship Force Clubs next week to go to. We're looking forward to attending that too. So it's very, very uh, timely. Uh, and I'd like to welcome our own Friendship Force Sacramento members. Uh, members of Friendship Force International from clubs around the world, um, and then Renaissance Society, and probably several others. Anyway, welcome everyone. Um, I have a, a couple of business announcements for Friendship Force Sacramento to be very quick. One is check your newsletter. It's going to be coming out uh, early May, and it'll have some updates to our program. We've got some new journey coordinators and uh, some advances on our trips for next year. And we've got some slight program changes for our monthly calendar coming up. So it's all in the newsletter. Just look at it over carefully because things have changed a bit. Uh, and then I want to ask the Friendship Force Sacramento board members to hang around at the end. We have a, a, a board question to ask you at the end. So please Stick around if you're on the Friendship Force Sacramento board. With that, uh, Chris and Julie, please take it off. All right, we will. So let's get this PowerPoint up and going. Chris, were you going to do the video first? It's Kathy. Got it. Yeah, thank you. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, before we get started, um, well, let me see. I've got to change this, stop this. Hold on, I clicked one button wrong. Got to get to this one, share the wrong screen. There we go. That's the one I wanted. So um, before we get want started, we wanted to give you a little information about the Friendship Force, because uh, uh, there's a lot of you that don't know who we are, and that's the organization we traveled with, and it's also the organization hosting today's program. So um, it's a nonprofit cultural peace organization. We have one of our slogans is a world of friends is a world of peace. And uh, I really like that. And to me, um, it, it's one of the slogans that reminds me that um, we don't drop bombs on our friends. So if we can create more friendships, we can create a more peaceful world. And the way Friendship Force does this is through home hosting. Um, people travel as a group, usually maybe 15, 20 people. They stay in a host family, a host city for about a week at a time, and they're hosted by the local people living with people in their homes. And it's that time around the kitchen table that really is the best part of it to me is when you learn about a culture from someone uh, in their own home and you can ask very personal questions and share things. We also host people in Sacramento. Our club is very active. And we normally, we host four or five times a year, uh, depending on, well, not now, but in the past. <laughs> we will start again in 2022, though. Um, there's over 300 clubs in about 60 countries, over 16,000 members. Our Sacramento club is about 110 members strong. And if you want to get more information, look at ffsacramento.org or just Google Friendship Force from wherever you live, and it'll give you some more information. I'm going to share a little video. It's only two minutes long. Um, but I think it's really a nice one to um, let you know how this organization works. Oops, hold on. It was a little slow start there. There we go. When the differences between us seem so large, how do we come there's together? A, there's, there's chaos, lots of errors. How do we overcome fear and hatred with understanding and goodwill? Our solution is a force as simple and powerful as opening your home or traveling to someone else's home. Now more than ever, we live in a world of heated divisions in which so many speak, share or post, but few actually pause and listen. But what if the simple act of traveling could become an act of peacekeeping? We are Friendship Force International, a non-profit organization that facilitates travel experiences for people all over the world. 
we recruit private citizens as friendship ambassadors to travel internationally, immersing themselves in local culture in order to spread the message of international friendship and global peace. Our values remain more relevant today than ever. We've grown into a global network of Friendship Force clubs, organized and led by volunteers in more than 60 countries, totaling approximately 16,000 members worldwide. Through the exciting personal encounters we facilitate, cultures are shared and strangers become friends. And when we experience different views, we can discover common ground. Now more than ever, it's vital that citizens like you step forward to share your experiences. Now more than ever, we need to replace our condemnations with questions, our desire to judge with a desire to understand. So experience different views, discover common ground, become a part of Friendship Force today. So Julie and I have been in Friendship Force for about 30 years now and been making friends all across the globe. And today we look forward to sharing our trip to Germany with you. So hiking in Bavaria. Again, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat anytime. We'll address them at the end. And forgive our poor pronunciation of German. We speak a little Spanish, but no German. Nein. <laughs> so um, quite often when we travel with the Friendship Force, we add on to, to the beginning or the end of our journey um, some private time of our own. And we did that in this trip as well. We flew in and out of Munich. And um, for this one, we had three days to explore Munich before we got started. Um, I really like this city a lot. It's just it's so easy to get around, really walkable. It's a super public transportation system. They have this app that you can get on your phone and it helps you get around anywhere. And it links all the buses and trams and you know all, all the ways to get around town. It's really, really nice. This was the new town hall, which I thought was funny because it was new, but it was built in 1867. And of course, near the city center, there's a beer garden and a farmer's market area. But one of the places we really enjoyed was the residence. It was um, mostly constructed between 1550 and 1650. There's 130 rooms uh, for the Witzelsbach family who ruled over Bavaria for about 500 years. This is the antiquarium. It's one of the oldest rooms in the residence. And so it was a banquet hall. But that's Julie way down there at the end to give you an idea of the scale of this thing. It's just gigantic. Can't imagine what kind of party you could have in there. So on our tour we took, there were about 90 rooms open on display. Um, they have an audio guide so you can go at your own pace. Um, it's just really well done, you know, with one of those ones where you can link through to the artwork or whatever and find out information about anything that interests you. And of course, a family that important had a big treasury, lots of diamonds and rubies here. Another place we enjoyed a lot uh, was the English Garden. It was created in 1789 and it's about a, a mile and a half square, of beautiful parkland. But the surprise for us was that they created a surfing spot in the middle of Germany, and a little bit of California right there. So. It was very popular too. They had a line of people who were ready to go surfing. Oops, this mouse is delaying. Okay, so this was our first experience with the German beer gardens. Um, and here, when you purchase the Stein of beer, you get a token. And when you return the mug with the token, you get your deposit back. So that was a, the first of many beers we had in Germany. We also took a day trip from, from the train trip to Salzburg in Austria. As you can see, it's very close to me. So there were three of us on this trip, me, Julie, and Rick Steves, our travel guide. And Salzburg's got its name because it was a major salt trading city and the salt was transported down the river here. It was the home of Wolfgang Mozart too. And we enjoyed an exhibit about his father, Leopold, who was a court musician to the royal family. They had a 
uh, their home open for tour, one of their homes, I think. Two of their Two homes. Two of homes, actually, Two myself, homes. yeah. And the old city has these narrow walking streets and these charming hotels and cafes are throughout the area. Well, up on the hill is this castle that was built in 1077. You can walk up or there's a funicular. They got a lot of museum rooms in the castle. But one of the places we liked was on the top, they have a restaurant that looks out. It's on the castle walls and it looks out across uh, the countryside. It was really a nice place for lunch. And another day trip we took out of uh, Munich was to, uh, it was a bus tour. This was a group bus tour uh, for Mad King Ludwig. And we went to his homes at Linderhof and Neuschwanstein and visited the Oberammergau. This was Linderhof. It's very small, but beautiful. Um, apparently he lived there alone, they say, but he only had one friend, composer Richard Wagner. I don't know if that's true, but certainly in a small place. This is the countryside that you see around Oberammergau, which is the site of the Passion Play that they give every 10 years since the town was spared during the Black Plague in 1634. It's a really pretty little town with flower boxes and famous for their painted walls and the homes of businesses with scenes of fairy tales. Well, this is a castle where Ludwig lived as a child. And from here, he could look up to see the ruins of another castle on the opposite hill. And that's where he decided to build Neuschwanstein in 1869. It was designed by a theatrical set designer and Ludwig wanted it to look like a medieval castle. I think he did the job. These shots were from the internet. We couldn't take any pictures on the inside, but um, you get an idea of how luxurious it was. It was open for tours very soon after he died. And here's a view from the balcony of the castle, looking back to where his former home was down on the castle below in the little village. <coughs> okay, Here we are at the train station, ready to start the official uh, friendship course part of the journey. And we're gonna take the train up to Nuremberg. The um, Friendship Force of Nuremberg is the club that organized the trip for us. And our host family lived in the town of Erlingen, just a little bit north of that. And this part of Bavaria is known as Franconia. And the area just to the east of that is the, um, where we're gonna hike. And that's called Franconian Switzerland. And this is the home of our host family. And on this journey, we just had three nights of home hosting. So two nights before the hiking and one night after the hiking and the rest of the time we stayed in hotels. And there's our hosts, Beata and Peter, a lovely couple. And they were brand new Friendship Force members. And this is the first time they ever hosted. And Beata took us on a tour of Erlingen. And we went by bicycle because that's the way most people get around town. And Erlingen was a little small village until the Huguenots were invited to come in the late 17th century. And now it's a modern city. And a lot of people there work for the Siemens company that has a um, big office there. And this is one of the oldest cafes in town. And it's called Mengen. And that was one of the original Huguenot families that settled there. And this is the main city square and city hall. And it's a university town and the university specializes in medical and natural sciences. And here we got some students taking a break between classes. And behind them is a university building that used to be part of a palace. I think it was the Orangerie. And that evening was the Friendship Force welcome party. 
and that's where we got to meet all the other hikers and our German hosts. There were 19 of us hikers. Most of us came from the U.S., but there were some from Canada and then um, a couple, two came from northern Germany, I think Frankfurt. Great potluck. That's the dessert table there, loaded with lots of uh, homemade German sweets. And next morning, we all met in Nuremberg for a city tour. And that was with the whole group. Nuremberg was the unofficial capital of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, and they held uh, imperial court there. And that's the entrance to the fortress. And there were a lot of city-states all throughout Germany at that time, and the kings would travel from castle to castle. And Nuremberg was uh, one of the most important meeting places. Nice museum inside. And the castle had two chapels on two different levels and there was a hole in the floor between them. And nobody really had a good explanation as to why they did that. And this is the old city street just below the fortress. And a lot of the city was destroyed in World War II and uh, they restored it into the old style there. That's Beata. She wanted to make sure we got some of the best ice cream in town. So she quickly went into the ice cream shop. But when she came out, the group was gone and she had to run through the streets with melting ice cream until she found us. But it was worth it, it was delicious ice cream. And most towns in Bavaria have their own Oktoberfest. The one that's in Munich is the largest and the most famous, but this turned out to be the first day of the Nuremberg Oktoberfest. And this is a ceremonial horse carriage that's bringing in beer kegs. And that's the city center that had a farmer's market that day. Main cathedral. And inside they had this lovely statue of a very happy Mary. And this is a uh, almost life-size life statue of the architect. And he's depicted there supporting the weight of the building on his shoulders. Oh, and this is a traditional Oktoberfest game. So the idea is you try to knock the other guy off the boat with your stick and then your teammates in the boat help you get into the right position. And there we got a winner. <laughs> so these guys could really look like they're ready for some beer. And Nuremberg was the home of the artist Albrecht Dürer. And this is one of his most famous drawings. It's dated 1502. And this very bizarre sculpture in the town square was inspired by that rabbit. And we all had lunch in this lovely restaurant built over an old bridge over the river. And we had traditional Nuremberg sausages and sauerkraut. Okay, so now it's time to start hiking. Um, Bavaria Friendship Force worked out, worked for months uh, to organize this journey for us, including making a great brochure with daily schedules. And Claudia was one of the leaders of the hike. She was super well organized. And her husband, Stefan, who's with us tonight, I hope he's still awake because it's <laughs> midnight there. <laughs> uh, he led the hikes most of the days. And then Willie, he was in charge of transportation. He would take the luggage from hotel to hotel. So all we had to do was carry our day packs with our lunch and water and cameras, things like that. But um, Willie made sure our stuff got to the next hotel. So it was a really luxurious way of hiking. On some of the days, the German host families got to join us and uh, Peter was able to walk with us on the first day. And this one was called the five breweries hike, six and a half miles. 
So we started in the town of Weissenho. I Sorry, Stefan, I'm not sure about that, but you can read it on the side of the truck and pronounce it any way you like. The trail passes by five breweries. Apparently, it's a very popular uh, hike on the weekends for obvious reasons. Uh, the area is said to have the largest concentration of breweries in the world. And that may be why we had so many of the German hosts join us on this one. Here we are passing by the first brewery, a little too early for this one. And our walk, you'll see, takes us through many small towns as we go along. Um, I, was really, I was really pleased with the combination of city and country in this journey. And our hosts made sure we didn't miss any of the turns. But we also discovered there are these directional arrows, arrows throughout the area. So each symbol represents a different hiking route. And people come from all over the world, uh, individual or in groups, uh, to walk the different paths. So this, you know, if you're into hiking, this could be something you can do on your own very easily. It's a little view of a water pump in a square in one of the small towns. We're walking along, we only had time for window shopping. And here's another one of the painted walls on the buildings. This is the first of many uphill climbs we had, although we enjoyed seeing this old car as we climbed up past it. And some of the villages are on hillsides We also hike through farmland. And if I understood it correctly, uh, the farmers are required to leave access for the hikers either through or along their fields. So it makes it really nice to be able to um, go through this countryside without having to worry about um, access roads. And when we seemed about the right time, we just stopped for a break, took our lunch. And we travel on again. So we finally made it to the fifth brewery near the end of our hike. And on this one, we had time to enjoy a Rattler, which is half beer and half lemonade. So very refreshing, but in case you drank too much, there was a little warning sign. And we made it to our first hotel it was in the town of Goschwenstein. Uh, so we were there for two nights. Lovely hotel. Okay, here we got day two, going seven miles this day. And you can see there are um, more of the trail signs for the hikers. And we found out that hiking is really popular in Germany and there's lots of walking and hiking clubs that organize trips like this. And most of the little small towns in the area had a map like this and kind of gave you the big picture of the hiking trails in the area. And this day we're going for a big loop. So we're gonna head up into the mountains and this is just a view looking back at town. And we pass this huge limestone rock and down kind of back down the bottom in the center there, there's a entrance to a cave. And that's what's inside the cave. It's a pilgrimage stop for Christians. And trails are enjoyed by the local people as well. And we passed by a lot of archways, caves and archways. And here we are coming out of the other side of the archway. And another one of many group photos that we're gonna have during the week. Lovely forest. Meeting with the locals. That's our lunch stop for the day.
and resting up a bit after lunch so we can be ready for the afternoon trek. That's got a little bit steep in spots. And I remember every morning before we started, Stefan would say a little bit of up and down today. And usually it was a bit more than a little. And in this spot here, uh, we really needed each other's help to get down this one section. And there's a lot of corn growing in this area. And this farmer is growing corn for biofuel, not for food. And machine on the left, harvests the entire corn plant and chops it up into little tiny bits. And then it gets dumped into the truck that's on the right. And then that gets transported to the power plant. And that's how small it gets chopped up. So we're making our way back into town and you can see the castle that's on the top of the hill in the center there. And that's our, that's our next destination. Lovely castle entrance. And had several, several rooms on display that we could look at. And we had a drink at the castle and that was to celebrate the first anniversary of one of the German couples. And it was a combination of cherry liqueur and sparkling wine. It was quite lovely. And only two casualties that day. And now we're heading to the Goshwinstein Basilica and it's an important pilgrimage site built in the early 18th century in the Baroque style. And this is a museum about the pilgrimages, but we had to take this picture because the name of the museum really makes us English speakers laugh. And inside is lovely carved angel with his feet dangling. And our host had arranged for a professional organist to give us a concert. Right, day three, 8.3 miles. Another day of up and down. And we came across some lovely flowers as we hiked along. One day, Julie and I saw this strange, fast moving object that we thought was a hummingbird. It came flying by, flying by so quickly and feeding on the flowers. We got back to Sacramento and we looked it up and it's called a hawk moth. I've, not, I've never seen that. It's an unusual insect that flies around like a hummingbird. And often we walked along streams and we saw a lot of piles of wood. And so I'm guessing they burn a lot of wood during the winter here. So on this day, I think we had our most difficult and steep climb. It was really a challenge for some of us, and um, but the reward was worth it. We came out through this large cavern and um, then onto, oops, slide things not working correctly, and through some more farmland. We stopped for a long break at lunchtime just to rest up, give her feet a break too. And I think this was the town of Overrailsbach. They had great yard art. I really liked it. Some, some gardener with a real sense of humor, I thought. And here's one of the small community churches we visited. 
it's a little bit plain from the outside, but the inside was really lovely. Again, that Baroque style. So on this day, we did stop for an afternoon beer or a Rattler. It's the half beer, half lemonade. I like the car door and going to the bar there. We didn't have a full, the big beer this time. It's one of the small ones, but it's delicious. And afterwards, we continued on and found out that this area is popular for mountain climbing as well as hiking. We saw some climbers as we went along. I don't know how they do that. Or why? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we saw a memorial to uh, fallen climbers. So it's always fun to go through these archways, not knowing what you're going to find. This was one of the largest caves we visited. It had a great framed view of a church on a hill. And we finally made it to our destination for the next two nights, the Castle Robinstein. It was built in the 12th century, destroyed in 1450, rebuilt in 1570, destroyed again in 1648, rebuilt again in 1829, and then recently restored as a hotel. You enter by crossing this bridge over the old moat. And some of the rooms were like a museum. In this hotel, Julie and I got lucky. Our room was in one of the towers overlooking the countryside. So this was the view from our room, this spectacular. And we were living like royalty. The group dining room was very elegant. And that evening we had a nice cocktail hour where we could share some stories and get to know each other a little bit better. It was a nice reward for the end of a long hike. All right, here we are day four. We're gonna go six miles this day and we're just gonna do um, a loop trail and that's out and back from the castle. And this is something really nice. Claudia and her team had organized for each hotel to set up a buffet, and that was separate from the breakfast buffet. And that was for us to make a picnic lunch to take with us on the hike. And usually they had a selection of nice fresh bread and cheeses and meats, usually some fruit, maybe a cookie, juice. And again, through some small farm towns. It was really nice walking in a group and there was always someone interesting to talk to. It just kind of depended on who was walking next to you that day. And this is the town of Weichenfeld in the River Valley. And walking is a really great way to explore the countryside. You can see so much more than you would from a car or a bus. Next, we hike up to the castle ruins that are above the town. And the stairs got a little steep. You can see the guy on the upper right sitting on his balcony there watching us climb. And not a lot left of the castle on this part except for the tower. Then on our way back down the hill, we passed this church that was built right into the hillside. And they had a really nice memorial and that was to the townspeople who had died in both the world wars. And back on the trail.
Then back to the castle. And we got back to the castle in time for the falconry show. And it was all in German, so we didn't understand much, but we really enjoyed seeing the, the birds in flight. They had three or four birds that they had out. Well, the morning, yeah. Yeah. And the castle has an extensive aviary. And they said there's 80 species of birds in the park. And we had enough time before dinner and there was a short hike down to the entrance of Sophie's cave. And they said there was evidence here of use by humans during the stone age. And they said they also found bones of cave bears in here. That's two large rooms. And during our visit, they had a sound and light show with classical music and the acoustics in there were pretty amazing. <laughs> our, our clicker is not, it's going slow. You click it and then it like hesitates and then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So excuse us if the transitions are a little weird. Bouncing around a little bit. We're like, it didn't do this when we practiced. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, six and a half miles today. So we start off through the countryside again. Um, I just love this area. More signs. And again, these are for the hikers, not for cars. And sometimes we had to get out of the way of the farm equipment. And sometimes we ran into locals that would chat with us. Seemed like every little village had charming cottages. Some of the caves had bats in them, but we, you know, signs saying they had bats in them, but we didn't see any. So this one had a frame view looking out in the cave. Nice place to sit and relax. Okay, so whenever Julie and I go somewhere and we see stairs, we have to go up. It's just a requirement. So um, no change here. Saw some stairs, had to go up. These are the stairs up to the rock. I think it's called Falkenstein. Anyway, it uh, was worth the climb. Beautiful view from the top. And looking down at the village below, which is our next stop. The Franconian Swiss, Swiss Museum. This had a nice display of uh, about the local culture, the way people lived. And they also had uh, archaeology and geology displays. Um, we learned that the reason there's so many caves in this area is that there was once a seabed. And so that thick layers of limestone had formed, later lifted up, and then weathering, of course, by erosion, underground streams um, caused these caves to form and all that we've been walking through. And they had an exhibit with a skeleton of an ancient cave bear. They also had a, a display of a synagogue um, from the 17th to the 18th century, something like that. Um, so this town welcomed the Jews and um, they had a special place for them there. I really liked walking around the town too. Um, just these lovely little gardens everywhere. And this one had what looks to be a bread oven in their front yard. And here's one of the locals planting flowers and vegetables. In the afternoon found us back on the trail. More caves. More trails. <laughs> Until we reached our destination of uh, Puttenstein, our home for one night here. And this one, our hotel, uh, it's on the main square, a little, little nice 
spot there. But um, on this one, Julie and I weren't so lucky. Our room was at the very top in the attic. Um, There's a cozy room, but it had a little challenge because you had to really open the bathroom door a special way to be able to squeeze yourself through because it was pretty narrow and had a sharp angle on it. But uh, it was cute. It was fun. Okay, day six, six and a quarter miles. So for, of course, we're starting out our day with a hike up and we're heading up to Pottenstein Castle, which is a thousand years old. And that is the home of St. Elizabeth. And she's famous because she transformed a basket of eggs and lard into roses. That's the entryway into the castle, really, really well protected. And I had a few rooms on view for us. Kind of get a feeling for what it's like to live in a castle. And next stop is what they call the Sky Ladder, built in 2014. 37 meters high, and you really got a great view of the countryside from up there. And Stefan brought his drone that day, and he got the absolute best group photo of the whole trip. And continuing on, more caves. And using a flashlight, see if there's anything Way in the back of the cave, there wasn't. <laughs> and heading back down. These houses are built right into the rock walls. And another view of town on our way down. And it seemed like every town we visited had a couple breweries. They said there's about 70 breweries in Franconia, Switzerland, and many of them still follow the centuries old German purity laws. But we decided our reward for working hard that day was ice cream cone. And then we had a short bus ride into the town of Muggendorf. And this is our hotel for the next two nights. And this time we got a really nice room, really large and comfortable. Okay, day seven. This is the longest day for us, 10 miles. We're going to make a big loop around this valley along the hillside, across the valley, and then back up the other side. A little crisp and cool in the morning, so we were wearing layers. And here Gunther is uh, giving us directions and we were joined by Kirsten Hogan. She's a regional support manager for French of Force International. She lives in Munich, but joined us for the day. She's in the back there. Of course, there'll be more caves. And beautiful lookouts over the valley as we hike along that hillside. You just walk through the trees and then there'd be this great opening This is a view of the castle Nidek. Um, we're going to be there later in the afternoon. And we came down through some more castle ruins. And along a little stream. Then crossing over the river Weissen. Oh, and we did uh, visit the Bing Cave. It was discovered in 1905 by Mr. Bing. It was carved by an underground river. And then these beautiful stalactites and stalagmites were formed. And the old castle has a commanding view of the valley. So Gunther gave us a little history lesson while we were there. We 
before we hike back to Mugendorf. Okay, day eight, zero miles, no hiking today. So our host picked us up at the hotel in the morning and then we all went to visit this um, Castle Grafenstein built in 1172 and then rebuilt in the 17th century. And then uh, the von Stauffenberg family, von Stauffenberg family still lives there. It's a, actually a private home, but they give tours. And that was the home of Klaus von Stauffenberg. And he was executed after a failed plot to assassinate Hitler during World War II. And the movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise was based on that story. And then back to Nuremberg, we had our farewell dinner and a greeting from the mayor. And had the tables decorated beautifully with flowers and then the greenery there is fresh hops. And of course, delicious food, but it's always sad to say goodbye to new friends. And one of our hikers wrote a song for us to sing, and it goes to the tune of She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain. And I'll read just a couple verses for you. The hikers came to Nuremberg from afar to explore Franconia without a car. We climbed up to the castles. We hiked down to the rivers. Every day was long, but not too far. The welcome and the farewell were first rate. The food was so delicious, so we ate. The laughter was so warming. Our hosts were all so charming. Beginning and the ending were just great. In between, the hiking made us fit, harder than we thought, we must admit. But we all kept on walking, encouraged by the talking, everyone inspired not to quit. And I thought that was so clever. And then our German host sang a song for us. <laughs> Fun. That was a great time. But we had to say farewell to our new friends. So well, Julie and I had uh, one more day. We were going back to um, Munich. So uh, the Oktoberfest was just starting. We had a discount train ticket to Munich and found that the 9.30 a.m. train was full of people dressed in their lederhosen and dirndls already drinking beer at the 9.30 in the morning on the train. But it made for quite a... a a fun trip, shall we say? <laughs> they were singing too, I think. <laughs> I oh, know, yeah, now that I remember, yeah. They were singing. So we weren't sure when we got to Munich how we were going to quite find the Oktoberfest. But when we came up from the train station, we discovered all you had to do was follow the signs on the sidewalk, or you could just follow the crowds. So Munich, uh, the, the Oktoberfest there is like a carnival, you know, rides and games and food booths. Uh, I was quite surprised at how large it was. And they have five large beer halls and a lot of smaller ones. Uh, I think from after five o'clock, you need to reserve a seat in the, at least in these larger halls. Um, so that, you know, be able to have a seat for dinner and drinking. But in the afternoon, you can sit anywhere you want and just join in on the fun. Um, we were entertained watching the wait staff carry these huge piles of beer to their waiting customers. It was a tasty way to say goodbye to Bavaria. So okay. Chris, I've been monitoring the chat uh -huh. and I saw we had two questions so far. The first one is from Steve, where he's asking about the corn that was harvested. And his question is whether or not the corn was for biodiesel, ethanol, or both, or if you know. Don't know. Do not know. <laughs> OK. And, and we did have someone ask what time of year you went, but it's September 29. I put that in the chat. I answered yeah, that one. 
Yeah. yeah. And one thing to mention about the time of year, um, Claudia sent a nice packing list with us before we left. And uh, one of the things that she kept telling us was to bring your rain gear because it was going to rain. She said, it's going to rain. Boots. Waterproof <laughs> boots. So, so we were, you know, very anxious about that, about hiking in the rain and not sure how that was going to work. And it turned out beautiful. It was like the most incredible week all the weather was just you, you couldn't ask for better weather it was just spectacular so oh that's nice another question um sylvia at or sylvie asked was the itinerary of hikes organized by the ffi clubs in germany yes by mm -hmm. the bavaria club there from uh, um erlangen nuremberg. and nuremberg yeah Lots and lots of comments, you guys, about the beautiful photography. So thank you so much. Welcome. It's all Chris. <laughs> uh, a couple and of minutes. I yeah. think let's see. Oh, Chris. <laughs> um, wrong with a subject matter like that, you know. Yeah, exactly. I had a question. How many um, clubs were represented? Oh, that's a good, good question. question. I'm not sure if we would be able to tell, but we had uh, just skimming through the participants list here. Um, we had uh, a couple from Canada, and then we have uh, Solana Beach, California, San Diego, Sun City, Arizona, uh, Northwest Seattle, Spokane, Washington, or Sacramento, uh, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Eagle Lake, Ontario, Ketchikan, Alaska, two, two from there, uh, Holland, Michigan. Uh, Michigan, and Brunswick, Georgia. So I just guessing maybe 10, 12 clubs. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really fun to, <laughs> to go on a, on a, what we call a journey in Friendship Force, where you meet <laughs> people from all over the world, literally. I'm going to remove my spotlight, Kathy, so we can see you too when you're talking. Oh, I'm actually, I don't have my video on. The next <laughs> question is, right. um, oh, so someone asked, did, have you ho asked if you host others here in Sacramento? I answered, we typically host four or five times a year. Yeah. But because you and Julia have been members for about 30 years, I mean, you, I think you've lost track of how many, oh, yeah. how many clubs. Yeah, lost track, but I think we're somewhere in the 40 plus hostings because unfortunately, unfortunately, I, we sometimes have more people who want to host than we have people coming. So since Julie and I have been in it so long, we try and give other people that opportunity. Yeah, give the new um, members. Yeah, give the new members a chance because so we could have hosted even more, but. It just, you know, we didn't want to share. Yeah, you want to <laughs> share. But, but we love it. I think when we first started in Friendship Force, all we did was host. We, um, Julie's work as a pharmacist, she had to schedule her vacation a year in advance. And it made it really difficult for us to travel with the Friendship Force. So, um, but, so initially, uh, our experiences were just hosting in the beginning. And we, we love that. I think it's uh, such a great way to share your city with someone else. And the other thing that we discovered was that you, you learn more about your own city because you're driving along somewhere with someone in the car and they'll say, what's that? And you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I've been driving by it every day and I never really paid attention. And you gotta figure you it gotta out. Figure what, out. What, is well, what is that? <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, that's kind of a fun little part of it. But, but again, as I said, it's that time around the kitchen table that to me is the most important part where you, um, you get to ask questions and share things or, or someone like them. We had a couple from Southern India um, they cooked, I don't know, several times. Oh, yeah. Like they three got or into four times. They just, and... they said, where's your Indian market? Which I said, I don't know. So we found, we found out, out and we went and found, found the Indian market and they bought a bunch of food and they cooked for us, I think, three or four nights it that fabulous. week. It was yeah. really good. Although after they left, we had a whole bunch of spices we didn't know how to use. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, a question about any language issues? Yeah, so um, not in Germany. Oh, um, everybody of course. in Germany Every, speaks yeah, beautiful they, it's, English. It's really, really easy to get around. Even when we were on our own in Munich, um, you know, or on the trains or anything, it, 
you can always find someone who speaks English. That's the, the good and the bad side of being an English speaker because we get lazy, um, unfortunately. Um, with Julie and I trying to learn Spanish just to get our brain going and to have another language. But um, so for us in most of these countries, it's pretty good. Now, there have been times when we're home hosting, um, particularly early on, we hosted people uh, from Kyrgyzstan, for example, that spoke Kyrgyz and Russian and spoke no English. And it's more difficult, you know, you have to get, in those days we had dictionaries, but you know, Google Translator, and um, it's harder to get a in-depth conversation, but um, it is very doable. It's surprising how you slow down your language and start, you know, figuring out just the little things, you know, are you hungry? Do you want uh, chicken or beef? <laughs> And you can find find things like that. So right, Marcy asked if this was church sponsored. I did answer, and I said no. Yeah. This was through uh, Friendship Force. Yeah. So Friends, yeah, one of the things I like about Friendship Force it's it's non religious, non political. We really don't have uh, a an agenda other than a more friend friendly world. So the idea is to learn about other cultures by living with people and sharing a personal a level with them. And by creating friendships, we'll have a more peaceful world. That's it. We don't, we're not, it doesn't matter what religion you are or, or what politics you have. Do you recall the name of the Basilica on day three by any chance? <laughs> we saw so I many churches. <laughs> Jeff, I'm gonna help us. I think Goshlinstein. Oh, could the, have been the pilgrimage one. Pilgrimage one. I think that was that Gosh was Gosh Stein, Stein, yeah. which I'm sure. Okay, and um, let's see. Tim's saying that he's used Japanese Canadian translators when they host clubs from Japan. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, it's much easier now that um, translators are kind of everywhere. Yeah. I just put in chat um, if you are interested in our next presentation, which will be about uh, some local day trips here in Northern California, Reno, um, just kind of in our area, but we love to share information. Some of these we, we actually do take our ambassadors who are visiting us on some of these trips, but I put the link to Eventbrite if you're not a local member, uh, our local members just sign up like you always do on our website. If you are not a local Friendship Force member, you could search Eventbrite for this, but I've also given you the link. So you could just copy that and paste it in your browser and that will get you registered for our, our next upcoming um, meeting. We'd love to have you join us. Um, Chris and Julie, I think that's everything that I saw. Just encourage people, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question that way, you certainly can do that as well. Lynn has a question. Do you think that they're going to have this, um, they're, they're going to redo this trip? Oh, the Bavarian know. hikes. Yeah, by the way, hi, Lynn. <laughs> Good to see you. We, met, we met Lynn on another journey to um, uh, Indonesia. Indonesia. You're in Florida still, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> that was about 10 years ago. About nine, ago, I guess yeah. nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I certainly so. hope so. I, I would uh, encourage you to um, keep in touch with them. You could probably look up uh, the Bavaria Nuremberg um, Friendship Force um, and just email them and just let them know that whenever they do it, you're interested because yeah, it was awesome. So yeah. a good point is you might want to mention that most journeys do not have this intense hiking. Yes, this, yeah. this yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, it tends to be an older, it's more sedentary, sedentary. group, <laughs> but, but um, we're, we're, Friendship Force um, has a lot, is, is trying to create different types of travel and different types of journeys. Um, one are these themed um, journeys where um, this one was, the theme was around hiking. Um, we did one where uh, the theme was birding um, in 2019. And we had people come from all over who were birders. That was not an intense hiking. That was the slowest 
moving group <laughs> I've ever done. <dealt> <laughs> But it was a lot of fun, but I didn't know birders could move so slow. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so we had different themes and different, um, uh, there was one that was drinking wine. I was like, that's the one I want to go on. <laughs> I think I missed that one. So, Thank you so much because you really captured our trip. This is, I've been to 33 different countries and this was one of the highlights of all of them. It was just such a wonderful group. I think the, the one thing to mention is the German group, uh, probably at least 10 people every day would hike with us. That's Not all of them would through hike every day, but some part of their group would hike with us every day. So we really had a real taste of um, the German uh, club too, which I really, oh, really enjoyed. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I think, Sue, that's a great point that um you know it was sort of like having home hosting because we were had you had these germans with you throughout the day where you could chat with them and learn about and they would share their stories with you so yeah that was great wonderful thanks for joining today sue appreciate that well it was just wonderful to share those wonderful memories yeah that was one of my favorite trips actually yeah totally a great trip Anybody it else was, have questions? Oh, it was Chris, delightful. Think, it was okay. delightful to host you Sarah, and to have you here. Sarah, Sarah, so you're full, you. you're full, of, okay. full of memories. Yeah. Great yeah. memories with you. Thank you for staying up so late and watching this with us. <laughs> well, hi Gunter. Hi Gunter. Gunter. Hello. Hi, Gunter. Gunter was our amazing host uh, in uh, Bavaria. A okay. Fantastic Thank host. You. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yeah. yeah, you were great, great, great guests. Yeah, yes, we had a wonderful we love, time. We love thanks, you. thanks for the time. Really yeah. yeah, you did an excellent yeah. job, very professional. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so to answer the question, you know, uh, we might, you know, consider to repeat it. <laughs> Good, you should. Yeah, I yeah. think, yeah, I think it is very popular. I think, yeah, I think even this one filled very rapidly, didn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, we had uh, more than 20, 25, uh, you know, interested people. But for some reason, some came uh, well, like you and some uh, they had some other obstacle in the way, you know, not to come. Mm -hmm. But finally, we had to limit it to, uh, well, the original idea was 15 people. Uh, yeah. Because a larger hiking group, you know, with such an... Uh, a demanding uh, trip, you know, it's a little bit uh, dangerous to do, finally. And you all stayed healthy and in good humor. <laughs> it was a beer. Yeah, the beers helped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Chris and Julia. That was awesome. Really great. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. I think Ray's going to take over and do a little meeting stuff for the Sacramento Club. But yeah. so those of you who are late or you want to sign off, feel free to do that. And thanks. We look forward to seeing you on another journey. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Beautiful. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I missed yeah. a good trip. Wow.